Good morning. You doing good? Enjoying camp meeting? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. You don't mind if I take my jacket off? If you mind, I will pray for you. <laughs> it's a privilege to be with you here. And it's going to be also a privilege when I go home to my wife. <laughs> My water is there. Thank you, though. Okay. <clears throat> I remember specifically the youth from the church went camping in nature. And uh, I always had too many ideas. I never missed ideas, moreover, for pranks. And the pastor talked about prayer. And I told him, have you seen the power of prayer? He says, yes. Do you want to experience it this weekend? And he said, yes. I said, okay, we will pray for it. And then after we ate corn on the cab, I took the leftover cab and I got it in the muffler of his car. <laughs> you know what that means. So he started the car and he finished. And after he drives like 10 feet, the car dies. Nothing. There was no way to eliminate the exhaust, you know. The... So he tried and tried and tried, and he asked us to push the car, and they looked under the hood. And I said to him, have you prayed? He says, no, you are a pastor, you should know better. They got around the car, and while they prayed, I pulled the corn cab off the muffler. <laughs> <laughs> and then he tried, and the car started. And I said, you see if you pray? Well, one of the youth saw me. He kept only one eye closed during the prayer. And he told the pastor. <laughs> and the pastor said to me, You are a good kid. You learn so many Bible verses by memory. You know chapters by memory. You come to church. But you never get it all straight. Do you ever, do we ever get it all straight? It seems that while we do go to church... And while we do love the Lord with all our heart, it seems to me that we... Oh, come on, start, please. Oh, sure it doesn't start. Now it should work. It seems to me that we never fully get it all straight. We still struggle. We still struggle. We have little things, some things that we cannot give up, we cannot, we cannot overcome. And yesterday we talked about finding Jesus with all our heart, loving Jesus more than anything else. You remember? Well, that's not enough. Today we are going to take one more step. And I'm going to read the Bible verse as we start. I'm going to read the Bible. It says, well, what happens? Why it doesn't show on the screen? Okay, amen. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and he hid it. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure. Uh, when I was a kid, I was at my grandfather's house from my mother's side. And my grandfather from my father's side was a godly man. But my grandfather from my mother's side was not so kind. In fact, if I told you some of the stories, you would think that he was a criminal. He was a monster. He was extremely bad. Extremely bad. He, for some reason, liked me, but he didn't like anybody else. So I was at his house. And with two neighbors, same age, we started to play hide and seek. And he didn't have a basement, but he had a crawl space under the house. Do I say it right? Crawling space, whatever, you know what I mean. And nobody would get there because there were spiders. I missed the class when they taught fear in school. I don't have that feeling of fear. I don't know what fear means. So I could, I could not care less snakes or spiders. I can eat them before they eat me, you know. <laughs> and so... I got there, and it was dark. 
and I go right in the farthest corner of the house. I mean, even if they came there, nobody would go there. And I knew they would never find me. As I am there, I touch something strange. I am in it. Next day, I went there with a flashlight, and I found three, literally, clay jars, so big, filled with gold. And I learned from my mom that that gold was, got, was somehow, uh, how you say, received from my great-grandfather from the Turkish, when the Tur Turkey Empire was taking over Romania. And he healed, killed some Turkey people from the army, and he took from the leader of the army that gold, and he hid it. And they came after him, and they could not find him, long story short. And he gave it to his son, and he gave it to my grandfather, and he kept it hidden. And when the communists took over, he had it there, and nobody could find it. And so I was foolish enough to tell the story. I found it. In fact, I saw in Western movies that they would take the coins and try them. So I did that. You know, I felt good. I did that to a gold coin, you know. Well, next day I went back after I told the story, and it was not there anymore. He moved it. And then he died. And nobody knows where he put it. And somebody else purchased that house. So I don't know how to go there and where to dig to find it. And somebody may come with a shotgun. Hey, what are you doing on my property? But I'm not telling them so they don't look for it. At least, you know. <laughs> so there is a treasure there and that's a real story. I don't know how, what is the value of those three clay jars with gold coins from the Turkey Empire. Can you believe that? Now I don't know the value, but I am asking you, if you found the treasure, Imagine that is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions, maybe a few billions, let's suppose, that could change, has the potential to change your entire life and your children and grandchildren forever. Would you be happy or not? Huh? Oh, you don't believe that. Uh, uh, yes. I would scream. I would jump up and down and dance the holy dance and... I would just celebrate forever. The guy found a wow treasure, unmeasurable value. Was he supposed to be happy or not? Okay. What is the treasure in the Bible, in the parable? Jesus. We found, listen carefully. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have this. We found Jesus and we decided to follow Jesus. And when you look to our Christians walking on the street, they are like beaten with baseball bats in the head. Why aren't we so happy? Why don't we scream and jump and rejoice? Can it be that we never actually found the treasure? So let's dig a little. Why do we struggle in our Christian life? If we found Jesus, if we got baptized, if we gave our life to Jesus, why do we still struggle? My grandpa that had the treasure was always stressed and angry. My other grandpa that had no treasure, he was always whistling and happy. What was the difference between the two grandpas? In the story, if you look carefully, number one, the man found the treasure. Number two, the man hid the treasure. Number three, the man sells all that he has. And number four, he buys that field. Number one, he found the treasure. Yesterday we talked about finding Jesus, giving all your heart to Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. Is that good or bad? You found Jesus, you gave your heart to Jesus, you got baptized. Is that good or bad? It's good. Praise the Lord. I am glad you said it. I thought you didn't eat today. Is that enough? No. Why some people get baptized and they think that that's good enough. That's the end of the story. How can you give birth to a baby and say, okay, take care of yourself? That's not the end of the story. That's the beginning of the story. The baby needs to grow up. And so, 
What is the treasure about? In the, in the parable, the gospel is the treasure, says Christ Object Lesson, page 104. However, if you keep reading, in the next paragraph, it says that the gospel is the good news of Jesus. And that Jesus is the treasure. Jesus is the treasure. This man found Jesus. And so, Jesus is the life, Jesus is the light, he is the bread, he is the door, he is the word that became flesh, he is the treasure. God himself, God himself, the treasure, came among people, lived among them, and they were talking about God, going to church, eating healthy, keeping Sabbath, returning tithe, going to camp meeting, and they killed the treasure. You follow me? They killed Jesus. God, the treasure, was among them. They found God and they killed God. Can you go to church, be baptized, know everything, do everything, and kill Jesus? Be in the church, yet worship the beast. Be in the church, yet be lost like the lost coin. Can you say that you follow Jesus and yet daily reject Jesus? I want you to read carefully the... Uh, give me one second. I'm going to go one slide forward. Okay, so the four steps, you already talked about it. It says that the, the guy found the treasure, found Jesus. But then it says that he did what? He hid the treasure. Why would he hide the treasure? I want you to understand what happens. Why would he hide the treasure? Hmm? I have hidden thy word into my heart. He, Jesus says, if you don't eat my body and don't drink my blood, you cannot be saved. I put it in my words. How can you eat his body? How can you drink his blood? The Bible says that people don't live only with bread, but they live with any word that comes from God's mouth. How can you hit the treasure? It's not enough to go to church. It's not enough to find Jesus. It's not enough to pray. It's not enough to study. You need to digest it. It needs to go into your bloodstream and fill your whole body, every single cell. You need to fill yourself with the treasure. The treasure needs to be like an like, like when you put an IV, it has to go in every corner of your body. The treasure has to take over, to flow through you. You follow me? Unless you are absolutely filled with the treasure, it's not enough. And I'm going to get there and give you some bad news and some good news. So, you hide the treasure. You need to internalize, to go deep, to search more. You need to digest it. You, you should not only study, I did three chapters today. You need to take one verse and eat it. You need to think about it. You need to pray about it. You need to repeat it. You need to think, ask questions. Go again, search, read the spiritual prophecy, read the Bible, pray again. Eat it to the point that you dig as deep as possible in that treasure. You need to make it yours. After he hides the treasure, he goes deep. He puts it into the heart. By the way, Jesus says uh, in Psalm, thy word is into, in my heart. And I don't remember the, the way it sounds in English. But the word should be in the heart, not only in the brain. You need to, you, to put it all in. After he hides it, he sells everything he has. Listen carefully. If anyone comes after me and does not hate mother and father and wife and children and brothers and sister and mother-in-law and his life, he cannot be, and his job and his car and his house and his education, he cannot be my disciple. The guy sells how much? There are people who sell 50% when they follow Jesus. There are people who sell 75%. There are people who sell 90%. People who sell 95%. People who sell 98%. Is that good? The 2% left over that you don't sell to Jesus. Who does it belong to? Hello? 
Satan, not self. If he doesn't belong to Jesus, guess what? He doesn't belong to you. He belongs to Satan. Don't, let's not fool ourselves. You know that if you don't sell everything, actually Satan has access to your heart. My father used to say, Satan doesn't need all your life. Jesus wants it all or nothing. Satan is happy with 1% or 2. As long as he has a corner in, in, in one of the closets, he can come into your house anytime. Because that's my corner. I need to go to my place. He has some ownership there. And so, and he then works from there. Jesus wants it all. The, the, the young, rich ruler comes to Jesus and says, uh, Teacher, what can I do to inherit eternal life? You don't do to inherit. You belong to inherit. You are born in somebody's family and because you belong to the family, you inherit. You don't do to inherit. You do to earn and you are born into it to inherit it. So he says, what can I do to inherit? And Jesus says, have you obeyed the commandments? And Jesus was challenging him to think. He says, oh yes, I obey all the commandments. I am a Seventh-day Adventist. We believe that you should obey. Not for salvation, but you know, we, we must obey. And Jesus says, wonderful. Sell everything. He said, well, I, I did sell about 40%. Sell everything. I could go to 75%. Sell everything. Lord, how much do you mean everything? And God says, absolutely all. All, all, nothing left over. Give it all up, surrender all, no control, zero. And the guy did what? He says, Lord, can I actually keep going to church and do all that I do and be a good Adventist? And Jesus left very sad. Why aren't we happy? Can it be that we never sell everything to buy the treasure? Can it be? Can it be that we don't understand what we learned yesterday, what Paul says? That I consider all things a loss for the price to buy, for the price of knowing Jesus, my Lord. You cannot have it both. You cannot keep this and keep Jesus. You need to give this up in order to get Jesus. You cannot have the treasure and some corners in your heart that you keep for yourself. It's a lot easier to keep Sabbath and keep all the doctrines than to surrender. Would you agree with me? And that's what God is looking for, the whole heart. So, how do you do that? The kingdom of God is like treasure hidden in a field. The man finds it, hides it, and then he does it how? Joyfully sells everything. Have you seen people that do it gradually? I got to go to evangelism. We have work B. Oh man, again. You follow me? Don't do it. Unless you do it joyfully. Don't do it because it's not received. You give it with all your heart and consider it a privilege. Praise the Lord. If not, keep it. God doesn't need your money. Literally. God can multiply a penny and make it into a treasure. God doesn't depend on you. In fact, all you have, he gave it to you. And God can multiply whatever. So if you don't realize that he gave it to you, and you don't want, I'm not talking about money, I'm talking about everything. And if you don't give whatever joyfully, don't give it. I remember very clear, I remember very clear when I was uh, struggling with some issues of giving, and my father called me and said, son, who gave you this and who gave you that and who gave you that? And one of them uh, was my motorcycle, you know. And uh, my motorcycle, I believe that I can take it to heaven because my motorcycle never sinned. And uh, yes, what's wrong with that? I'm kidding. And my father said, do you love God more than the motorcycle? And I said, yes, then give it up. And I said, well, God doesn't need my motorcycle. We look for excuses to justify what we do because we like it too much. And the things that we are not ready to sell are the things that we worship. And whatever comes between you and God, that's your God. And you can fool yourself and say that you worship God. We actually worship the things that we are not ready to sell. Give up 
everything that is between you and God. If not, that thing is going to choke your relationship with God. That thing is going to take your salvation. It is going to take heaven from you. Do you love Jesus more than anything? If that anything, it's something, you need to give that up. Why would God ask Abraham to sacrifice his son? Can it be that sometime we love our kids more than we love God and make them idols? Can it be that sometime we love our jobs or we love our whatever more than we love God? Whatever comes between you and God, that's what you worship. Do it, sell it joyfully. David fully devoted all his heart to seek the Lord. But in Hebrew it says that he fully set his heart to seek the Lord. That means that he programmed his heart. And even if he would fall, he would get up and he would say, this is the goal. This is the, the reason for my, this is the focus of my life. I'm going to seek the Lord all my life. And doesn't matter what happens, I'm going to get up again and keep seeking. I lost my kingdom, doesn't matter, I will seek the Lord. I sinned, doesn't matter, it's bad, but I will seek the Lord. And because he kept, he programmed his mind to live for one purpose, to seek the Lord, because of that God says, He is a man after my, my heart. When you fall, God doesn't say, oh, he failed again. When you have a baby, a uh, nine-month-old baby, and the baby is learning to walk and drops, you don't say to the baby, you failed again. You say, he is learning to walk. When you fall, God looks to you and says, he is learning to walk. But you need the righteous, says the Bible, seven times fails, but he gets up again. You need to set your mind, and instead of looking to what Satan wants you to look, to your failures, you need to say, I have decided to follow Jesus. I set my mind, I set my heart on this course. I keep my eyes on the captain of my salvation, and I am fully, with all my heart, ready to give up everything for the sake of fully getting the treasure. Basically, you cannot surrender, but you can choose daily to surrender. Seek my face, and that's what I do, Lord. Your face I seek. So, let's move on. Paul, after 29 years of serving God, he says, and I want to know him more than anything else. You need to keep seeking that treasure. After he sells everything, he buys the field with the treasure. The field is the word of God, says in Christ Object Lesson. The word of God, the, 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 that, that type of seeking to know God, prayer and study, prayer and study, says Ellen White, that prayer and study should never be separated. She says they go together, through prayer we talk to God, and through the study of the word, God talks to us. We should never separate them. How many people have the habit to study and pray? Great. How many people do it as a duty? Don't raise your hands. How many people do it for the sake of seeking the Lord and knowing the Lord and finding the treasure? Think about it. Praise the Lord. So, listen carefully. The, 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 the treasure, if you are serious, if you are with all your heart serious about the treasure, about Jesus, you are serious about prayer and study. You are serious about daily surrender. You are serious about commitment. You are serious about giving up. When God called Abraham and said, leave your country, Abraham didn't, okay, let's sell the house, see how much we get, put the money in the bank, and then see where we go. Let's get the plane tickets, and let's get the hotel rooms in the next location. Abraham left. He didn't say, what am I going to do with my house? Who is going to pay the bills? What am I going to do with my retirement, my job, my family, my children? He left. Because he knew the Lord, and if God says he will provide, you need to seek him first, and the other things will be covered. The reason we don't trust the Lord is because we didn't found enough of Him to know Him enough, to trust Him enough, and therefore we struggle. The solution is not to provide to the point that you feel safe. The solution is to know to the point that you feel safe. I don't know if you heard what I said. I know you did. So, if you want to find Jesus, you need to be serious about prayer, study, commitment, daily surrender. Christianity is not only to encounter Jesus, to be baptized, to find Jesus, to, to, to commit your life, to, to, to be converted. But it's to go daily back to prayer and word, and daily seek the treasure, and be passionate 
about more of Jesus. More of Jesus. I, rem- I, I told you yesterday, the more you seek him, the Bible says that if you seek me with all your heart, I will let myself be found. The more <coughs> you draw near to him, the more he draws near to you. The more you seek him, the more he shows himself to you. And then you see him and you say, wow. And you know him more and you love him more and you want him more, so you seek him more. And when you seek him more, he shows even more of himself. And you say, wow, what a treasure. And you forget the other things and you love him more and you want him more and you seek him more. And he shows more of him. You follow me? And you should daily get closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to Jesus. And your whole life should be a quest of finding Jesus. It's not enough to be baptized. It's good, but you need to keep growing. The more you seek him, the less you get the other things in order to get more of Jesus. You cannot have in this space room for both. You need to get something out to get something else in. Let me explain how you do that. In the World War II, in order to get the islands in the Pacific, they used three-step strategy. Number one, they were softening the place. They would throw in bombs from the planes, a lot of bombs from the ships, a lot of bombs to weaken the resistance. Number two, they would get in the island in a corner, take over, establish a base that belonged to them. And number three, they would throw bombs to the next part and to soften the next part and get another inch, enlarge the territory. And send bombs farther away and get another mile, and send bombs and get another mile, and they would soften, take over. Softer, conquer. Soften, you follow me? That's how they did it, until the whole island was taken. That's what God does with you and me. God is going to allow. It's not that he rejoices. It's not that God wants you to suffer. But we never get it. We are so self-centered that we don't even know how we are. So God is going to allow a sledgehammer in your life. You know what I mean? Some trials... And as we hit the trials, it, that means if you have trials, it means that the, the, the place is hard. It needs to be softened. So God allows the bombs to drop in, the crisis. And as the place is softened and we humble ourselves and we say, wow, what am I going through? What's happening to my life? As he allows the hammer to hit, because it's better actually to lose a leg or a hand. or so. If you lose it, not me, you know, as long as that would help you to be saved. So God allows the hammer in your life to soften the place. And when the place is softened, then God takes over a little base, a small corner in the island. And we call that conversion, baptism. I gave my life to Jesus. I have bad news for you. You did not give your life to Jesus. You did not give your heart. You gave him a base, a corner. You still have a lot of bad stuff in your heart. When you get baptized. He needs then, that's only conversion. That's only Righteousness by faith. You follow me? Is not sanctification. Then God needs to take another inch and another inch and slowly get out this and that and that and that and that and until he takes over the whole heart. You didn't give your heart to Jesus. You gave him a base. Do you understand what I am trying to say? And he needs to go through that process. And that takes a lifetime. Because justification, when you give your life to Jesus, takes a corner. Sanctification takes the whole heart. Whenever the bombs drop and the hammer hits, what do we do? We try to fix it. We look for a solution. We start calling around. We start complaining. We start blaming the spouse, the pastor, the church, or whoever else but not self, we start to pray, Lord, please, look what I am going through, Lord, please solve it. And instead of seeing the big picture that God is actually softening our heart and selling the bad stuff out and replacing it with a treasure, instead of saying, Lord, why do you allow it? Help me grow. Help me mature. We try to solve it and we think that enemies are attacking our island. It is God softening the place. Do you understand? 
Lord, please fix it. Look what I am going through. Now, you don't need to be fixed. You need to be surrendered. You need to give it up. You need to let it go. You need to learn to fix your eyes upon Jesus and remember that He's in control. He doesn't enjoy you to suffer, but He loves you more than you'll ever know. And you need to fix your eyes on Him and trust that He is working on you. Okay. The hardest part in the Christian experience is not when you give your life to Jesus, is when He is suffering in the place and taking the territories that you never sold to Him. Salvation is when God takes the whole island, the whole heart, and He has full control over it. Who has control in your life? You die to self daily, and He lives in you. Just then, you have the whole treasure. You consent daily to give it all, all your territories to Him, and then He can restore His image in you. So, many people get old and they still did not experience salvation. They, they still, their heart is divided. Now, let's take another step forward. We often confuse conversion with discipleship. We confuse conversion with discipleship. I'm going to give you... A Bible verse, it's uh, a few slides ahead. It says that Jesus was talking to a great multitude. And they came from Judea and from Jerusalem. And the disciples were there around him. Now I am asking you, who was the multitude? The crowd. Who was the multitude? Jesus was talking to a large crowd. And he says then, they were from Judea and Jerusalem. Who were the people from Judea and Jerusalem? Were they the Gentiles or God's people? Do you get it? Jesus was talking to the Seventh-day Adventists. And there were two groups. The church and the disciples. The crowd, the whole Everybody here and the disciples. That's only me. I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. And so, many times we confuse conversion with growth and discipleship. We think that if we come to church and get converted and are part of the crowd, we don't need to grow to fully following him and fully take, allow him to take over and fully be a disciple. But if you don't give up all things, you are not worthy to be called a disciple. So, Let's talk about it. I count all things a loss for the price of getting Jesus, for whom I have lost all things, and I count them scubalo, that means animal excrements, waste, rubbish. What are those things, all things, all territories that we need to give up from our heart? Let's go, to, go, go through them a little. Uh, listen, pride. Do we have pride problems? Yes or no? When you get baptized, you go into the water, you die, and the pride dies. When you get out, guess who comes out with you? Pride. And you go home and you argue with your spouse. Do you know why you argue with your spouse? Pride. You think you are right. If you are, not, if you are humble, you not think that you, are, you not think so high about yourself. You just keep quiet and be humble. We argue because we are proud. We get upset because we are proud. We get offended and hurt because we are proud. If you have no pride, nobody can offend you because you are humble. You don't think a lot about yourself. You say, I have no value. My single value is in Jesus. And if you offend me, you offend Jesus because I am nothing. I am dead. I have been crucified and you cannot offend dead people. You, all you can do, you can offend Jesus because I am dead. He is alive in me. So if you are humble and if you die to yourself, you cannot be offended. People can kill you and you say nothing because you know Jesus is going to defend you. Pride, we need to sell that territory. Selfishness. Selfishness. Are we selfish or not? Oh, all we do is for ourselves. We eat for ourselves, we get dressed for ourselves, we buy cars and houses for ourselves. We even pray for ourselves. And so, all we do, it's about self. Self is in the center. And Elena says that when we put self in the center, we do what Satan did. 
Jesus came and he gave up self and he came to serve, not to be served. And we need to give up self. Selfishness. We need to sell that territory too. Control. We try to control everyone around, even God in our prayers. We do whatever to convince him to do what we ask. You remember the saying, husband and wife. The husband says, I am the head. And the wife says, I agree. And I am the neck. <laughs> neck. I don't mind to be the neck as long as the neck can turn the head the way the neck wants. <laughs> the problem is who controls it? Who has the last word? We love control. Don't we? Temper. I don't have a temper, huh? We do or we don't. I know a church, I'm not going to tell you where, in the US where they had a fist fight and the police came and the ambulance came and the ambulance took one and the police took the other one. That was a holy fight. Do we have a temper? I like to have my shoes shiny, not these ones, but all the others. And I was in the train and somebody stepped on my shoes and I exploded. Don't you see where you walk? And then I had to get a napkin and get down and get it shiny again. And then somebody stepped and I got stomach pain. And I was like, yeah, they are stupid, they are blind, they are evil. I, they always step on my feet. And my wife says, before you give it up, they are going to step all over you. I said, I cannot give it up. And eventually I got so angry that I said, it's not good with me. So I said, you know what? Walk all over my shoes. And nobody did anymore. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Satan knows what you are sensitive to and he's going to send that one to get you. And before you give it up, you never overcome. And only what you give up, you get. And what you try to save, you lose. And whatever you lose, that's what you save. Isn't that strange? Temper. At, at the church, we are saints. When we go home, we develop horns. <laughs> we need to sell that territory too. Traditions. We Adventists don't have traditions. The Catholic Church has traditions. Really? I was in a church somewhere, I don't tell you where, and I wanted it. It was hot. Over 100. And no AC. And the church was absolutely packed. And I tried to take my coat down because I was already being in a sauna. And they said, you cannot. You lose your salvation. Nobody will listen to your sermon if you don't have a tie and a coat. I never knew that the coat and the tie can save you. <laughs> in a different church, they asked me to go to the stage with two in my right and two in my left. This one announces the song and praise in the beginning. This one announces the song and praise at the end. And I said, can we be only three? They said, no. This is the rule in our church. I said, show me in the Bible. I said, pastor, that's our church. You like it or not? I said, okay. Traditions. Do we have traditions or not? Yes. Oh, I could name a few that you will not like. But I am not going to go there. Traditions. Gossip. Oh, don't we love gossip. Some people live with it. It's like water for flowers. They don't even develop or grow or sleep or eat before they talk about somebody. They just love it. If you even listen, you are part of it. You are guilty. God sent you to love people and help people and pray for people, not to judge people. When you judge people, you make yourself God. Elena says, and I have here two, two quotations. I'm not going to put them on the screen from patriarchs and prophets. Those that judge others take the prerogatives of God, make themselves God. Another quotation, put it in my words, I, both sec, uh, quotations. Those that justify themselves in their sins are most severe in judging others. People that judge others, they hid sins and they justify their own sins. Who gave you permission to judge and gossip and, and criticize? Who, who do you think you are? And then we talk about people who like to talk. You go to a prayer meeting and somebody can talk forever and never pray. And they talk everybody away from the prayer meeting because they never stop talking. They talk even more than I do. You know, basically they just talk, 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 talk until they kill you. They love to hear their own voice. And nobody does except themselves. Have you seen those? But you say, but that's not a big sin. You don't break the seventh or the fourth commandment. Shouldn't we be rather listeners than talkers? 
we do have problems. And we say they are small problems. And because they are small problems, we never improve. We just feel to, the need to improve big problems like Sabbath and, and uh, uh, you know, integrity, moral issues. But small issues like criticism and, and talking too much and temper, we don't need to change. That's not too bad. And Satan is happy with that. In fact, people go so far that they criticize the church. It doesn't matter if you agree with something or not, but you got to love and pray for people, not criticize. They criticize the church and they feel that they are good and the church is bad. Who gave you permission to criticize the church? The church is God's object of affection and love. If the church, you feel that does something wrong, you need to pray for the church and do your best to help. But not judge, criticize, undermine that pastor, that conference president, that... If you are in their position, I am not sure you will do better. People who judge are people that have never been born again. Those sins are those that don't enter to heaven. Jesus says that a prostitute and the tax collector would go before the Pharisees and the teachers of the law in heaven. Why? Because the big sins, you feel bad about it, and you cry, and you repent. But the small sins, you don't feel bad, so you don't feel the need to change. It doesn't matter if you have an electrical cord, if you cut the cord, or if you roll the tank over the cord and break 10 feet of the cord. Electricity doesn't go through regardless how much of the cord you break. It doesn't matter how big or how small the sin. It breaks your connection with God. It builds a wall of separation. When you commit it, even the smallest is Satan leading. It's not Jesus. We need to sell those territories. We need to sell them. Bad thoughts. We don't do that, do we? My father used to say, son, there are birds flying all over your head. I said, Dad, what can I do? I mean, uh, the bad thoughts come. I said, well, there are birds flying all over your head. Don't let them make a nest on your head. You cannot stop them from flying, but you should not allow them to make a nest. You say, in Jesus' name, I rebuke you. Get away from me. And you don't allow yourself to think. But let me go farther than that. I mean, vengeful, hate, unforgiving spirit. Do we have that? If somebody that you don't like at work, in the church, somebody, and then you sing, meet me in heaven, we'll hold hands together. How are you going to get in heaven if you don't like somebody? <laughs> addictions, bad habits, addictions. Do we have addictions? Well, I'm going to give you a few. Good food addictions, soy addictions. <laughs> yes or no? Do you feel that if you eat healthy, you can eat whatever, whenever? There are people that eat vegan and they are addicted to food. Am I right or wrong? Huh? Yes. Addictions to church. Should we love the church? Yes. Should we worship the church to the point that it comes before God? You follow me? I don't know if I explain. Some people serve the church instead of serving God. We should serve God and through that perspective serve the church. Amen. You understand what I'm trying to say? Not to mention Facebook addiction. Some people live on Facebook. They tell you what they did last night. Who cares? Don't tell me what you do every night. Keep it for yourself. Leave me alone. <laughs> Cell phone addictions. Am I right or not? Shopping addictions. Sport addictions. Music addictions. I could go on and on and on and on. Hidden sins. I'm not going to go there. We need to sell all those territories. And then you talk about loving our family more than we love God. We do that or not? Focusing on job and things instead of God. Some people get two, three jobs and it's never enough and they are never satisfied. And when they see the neighbor's house, they say, man, if I had that house. When they see the neighbor's Tesla, I need to get a Tesla. Your Dodge is good enough. Your Chevy is good enough. Your Toyota is good enough. You don't need a Tesla. If you have it, give it to me. <laughs> never enough. Christians, some of them, never know the word enough. They always want more. They think that if they have more, they will be happy. 
It's like the turkey and the dog. The turkey and the dog on Thanksgiving, it's snowing, New York, they are outside, they look through the window, and the dog sees the dead turkey on the table and says, I wish I was inside. If I was inside, I would be happy. And the turkey from the yard looking to the dead turkey on the table says, I am happy or I am. You follow me? It depends on the perspective. Some people is never enough. For them is never enough. It's never enough. Because joy and happiness doesn't depend on what you have, but who you have. Not to mention that they become in bondage to things and to jobs. And they never have time for Jesus. If you ask them if they have time for study or for evangelism or for work or for the church, no, because I have three jobs. And Satan is going to give them more needs so they get more jobs so they never have time to pray and study. And God should come first. You should put study and prayer and church before job and you should trust that he will provide. Then some people... If you, basically, they love money. If you give them money, I know families, I'm not going to tell you where names. You give them 10,000 as a gift. They still complain they don't have money. If they have three jobs, if they, they never have money, they go in vacation, they never have money, and you can keep giving and giving, and they still complain. And some people have money, they don't complain, but they never give a penny. They would rather die, get out an eye, than to give a penny. Their hands shake instead of giving something, you know? And so, addictions, addictions, territories that we need to sell. Some people are lazy. Some people never work. Never, ever, ever work. For instance, for instance, I asked somebody. He came and asked for money, and he was healthier than me. He was a big guy, healthy, and he says, can you, pastor, give me some money? And I said to him, do you have a job? No. Are you sick? No. But I've never worked in my life, and my parents and my grandparents, nobody in our family has ever worked. And I said, come and mow my grass. I'm going to pay you 15 an hour. He says, I don't mow. I said, then wait until I give you money. Well, but you are a pastor. I said, yeah, in heaven I'm going to give you money. Some people never work. Oh, some people work too much. Sports and politics. Should we go to those territories that we need to sell? People have become so polarized when you talk about politics in our society. That listen carefully. In our society, if you don't agree with somebody, they become so emotional that they are ready to kill you. Hey, you don't have to be a Republican or a Democrat to understand that you need to love your neighbor. It doesn't matter if they agree with you or not. You don't have to agree with them, but you need to love and respect and pray for them. I have bad news for you. Politicians, regardless if Democrats or Republicans, don't care about you. They care for self. Why do we become so emotional that we forget to love people as we love self? What happened to Christianity? Competitiveness. I had a friend who would want to win every game, and every time he lost, he would get angry. I said, okay, I'm going to let you win. No, no, I need to win. Uh, why are you so competitive? And I could go on and on and on, but I need to finish. So, the hardest part is stage three to sell the territories to fully give up to fully surrender that jesus is fully in control and he because we are so hard in selling because we are absolutely unable to surrender and to get victory he allows challenges and crisis in our life he bombs the territory to soften the hard heart and then he takes another inch so when that happens instead of fixing it you should rather say lord Help me grow. How do you sell the territories? God created in heart an empty hole, a space that only God in that puzzle of the heart can fill. And God put himself there. And as long as you have God in the heart, his presence, listen, not his presence brings all other things like health and joy and peace and salvation and intelligence and family and food and work and, 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 and leadership and music and computers and cars. And his presence takes care of you. Satan has done something different. Satan replaced God with God's blessings. 
And that where sin comes in the picture. When we took God out and put God's blessings in, and then we seek blessings instead of seeking God. We are in love with blessings instead of being in love with God. And we pray for blessings instead of praying for God. And we crave blessings in, instead of craving God. God did not call you to 100% perfection, but to 100% surrender. And when you surrender daily, He's going to grow you daily to the statue of fullness of Christ. You cannot sell the territories. You cannot change your heart. You cannot overcome in your strength. But you can daily sell, surrender, invite, choose. You can say, Lord, today I am unable to survive. I have this problem and you name it, gossip. I have this problem and you name it, anger. I, but today you say the words, I sell it to you. I give it to you. Please, I am unable, take it. Do whatever it takes, even if it hurts. Use the hammer and the bombing and the surgery and the, whatever it takes. And replace that territory with your presence. I trust that you'll do it because you promised so. And you daily call him in and you daily surrender and sell another territory. And he will get the whole island. Is your joy found in the Lord or in something else? You cannot have both. Don't love the world and the things in the world. If anybody loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The crowd came to be healed. The church came to church. I go to church to get a blessing. Came to church for a blessing. Came to church to be healed. Came to church to be helped. Came to church to be forgiven. Came to church to, to get something. The disciples came to get Jesus. Are you the crowd or are you the disciple? What are you looking for? Peter says, Lord, we have sold everything. We have given up everything. And Jesus says, whoever gives up every, 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 all, all things will get 100 times here an eternal life. If you want to follow me, sell everything and then you find the whole treasure. Two types of love. Either we love God and surrender all or we love things and surrender partially. If you don't fully surrender, you hate God. You say, no, pastor, we love God. We just didn't fully surrender. Now, this is what Jesus says. He who is not with me, he is. The things that you don't surrender is where Satan is there in. And Satan hates God. And because you don't surrender, you love those more. So you hate God. You are an enemy. When those things... that are in the heart are not God then God cannot lead religion is only a form without power, without joy the more you surrender the more he can enter and give victory and change and transform are you willing to daily call upon the name of the Lord and surrender because religion has no power without that daily experience my computer refuses to work. If this is your desire, let's sing together. All to Jesus, I surrender. I want to shortly, shortly try to share with you a little story. And uh, that story is... Uh, uh, not very comfortable. It's that story I don't tell people too much because I don't like the story and I am trying to forget that story. When I was in ninth, tenth grade, some, something like that, I uh, believed in God. I did go to church. I did sing in the choir. I did learn uh, two Bible verses every day by memory, literally two verses a day all my life. Since I was two, three years old, I learned until I finished college two verses a day. <clears throat> I knew whole chapters by memory. 
I did eat healthy. I did believe in the spirit of prophecy. I did believe in the state of the dead, 2,300 days and nights and everything. I did everything an Adventist does. But I loved TV to the point that I was spending all nights on TV until morning. There was not one movie that I didn't watch. You could say any name of the movie, I watched them all. In fact, you could start a movie, a new movie, and I could tell you the end because they are all the same, you know. I got so good in movies that they became boring to me. I knew everything about movies. And then I started to like friends. And I got a group of friends, and they are not church people. And they were drinking, I didn't drink. They were taking drugs, I didn't touch drugs, I didn't touch smoke, pork, alcohol in my life, never. I didn't touch a girl before my wife and I got married, never had a girlfriend. But I spent every night with them and they were telling terrible jokes and then they were whistling after girls that would come from work at 11 p.m. And they were pushing the girls and saying bad words to the girls and I didn't feel good. But I liked the jokes and the movies, so I stayed there. And every time I would go home, I would find my father praying And I would ask him, why do you pray the whole night? And he would say, I'm praying for you. I know that you struggle. And I said, well, no, no, I didn't do anything wrong. I just go there. Did you hear me? I I, I don't do anything wrong. I just go there. And my father would say, if you are there and take care of their clothes, you are part of them. When Paul guarded their clothes and they killed Stephen, you know. And my father said, if you are there, you are part of them. You are one with them. You need to surrender every corner. As long as Satan has a corner, Satan has control. And you are an enemy. And I said, no, I love God. One night, they screamed after a girl and called her names and pushed her. And I said, leave her alone. And they said, who do you think you are? You don't belong here. You never drink. You never take drugs. Get away. We don't even like you. And I left. And they were whistling after that girl and she was walking faster. And I left. Next morning, I learned that they went after her and caught her when she went to the park and abused her. And they all went to prison. And the police did research and I was not there. I left way when they started to whistle. I left. So I had no clue actually what happened until next day. And I was the single one not getting arrested. And it came to my mind how Satan takes a corner and how Satan takes control. And if you don't give up all territories and you don't fully daily surrender, you don't even know before Satan gets you and ruins your life. And that night I went to prayer and I said, Lord, I would rather have you kill me but I'm not going to move from here before I fully give up. And my father came to me and said, are you sleeping? I said, no, I am praying. And I told him the story. And my father said, son, what is wrong in your mind? Do you think that you are going to get victory tonight? All you get tonight is forgiveness and conversion. And I said, when, when do I get victory? And he said, every day. And I said, you need to pray this prayer every day. Unless you fully surrender every day, you will die. That prayer I prayed, that night I prayed that prayer. I said, Lord, if you forgive me and you can still recover me and use me, I will surrender every day of my life. And I opened the Bible. I was in the beginning, so I was uh, 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 looking for signs. I opened the Bible. It was Isaiah 54. For a moment I was angry with you, but I will receive you back with a great love. Can the mountains move? My love will never move from you. And I started to cry and I said, I will surrender daily. And every morning since, I say, Lord, there may be some territories, some corners that I don't know. Please search me, kill me, beat me, hammer him, bump me, cut out of me. But please, I surrender that corner. Take it over. And I can tell you for sure that as long as you surrender and choose... God works and it doesn't matter where you are in that process as long as Jesus is working in you you are safe but there is no salvation without selling it all so if you feel that God is calling you to grow from conversion to surrender 
then you need to sing together with me and say, all to Jesus, I surrender. Let's sing together. come in humbleness we confess that we cannot change our hearts we cannot change our minds the human nature it's all beyond our power or anything that we can do we don't deserve it we are so small and so weak but father you promise that if we seek you with all your heart will find you you promise that those who come to you do they will not live empty-handed you promised to give victory to those who seek you father Please help us understand the unmeasurable value of Jesus, the treasure. Help us desire you more than anything else. And help us daily surrender. Daily in the morning seek you and sell everything and say, Lord, please take it because I cannot do it. I give it to you. I give you permission. Do whatever it takes. Please grow me to be like Jesus. And help us to fix our eyes on you and to trust that you who started this work, you are able and you will finish what you started. And we don't need to deserve or to understand. We need to trust in Jesus because it is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Help us never look to self but always keep our eyes on you. We pray in Jesus' precious name. And we believe and we love you and we praise you and we thank you, Lord. Amen.